Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, world. Hello, YouTube. Hello, chat. Can you hear me all right? Is everything out there in the world okay? I, uh, I have everything the same as last time, so hopefully my audio is okay. I don't know about hair, hair or makeup. Y'all aren't in charge of that. But yeah, let me know. Yes, 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 yes. Everybody can hear me okay. The chat's going a little fast today because we have a really amazing guest that I'm so excited to share with y'all. So Chad will help bring to my attention any questions when it's time for question time. And he's our friendly mod. Thank you so much, Chad, for helping out today. You know, we've been working up to this. We've been working up to this team. You all have helped me get organized, get the YouTube live going so that we could start to bring amazing guests like this on where everything looks pretty good, sounds pretty good. Uh, so thank you. It took a village. We've had a lot of fun lately. I have found things in my dad's archives that, I didn't know we're so special until I, I started chatting with expanding Dan and other friends that were like, oh yeah, that is definitely a gem and let's celebrate it. So thank you to the expanding Dan, Jake at the expanding Dan for helping us tell the stories of this stuff and present it in a way that's super fun and gives, I don't know, the, the the decades of storage <laughs> makes the decades of storage all worth it. So, you know, moving right along, I want to bring my guest on for today. And uh, I mean, Jeff Skunk Baxter has known me longer than I've known me. Him and my dad we're great friends. They were two peas in a pod. I'm pretty sure they're tied for most interesting man in the world. So there are so many ways we can take this conversation. Yes, we can talk about early Steely Dan. Yes, we can answer your questions. I have a few um, already set. And we'll also play some videos and some tracks from his newly released album because he's also going on tour. So you know what? Without further ado, I would love to bring on, let's see, let me set up my, I'm a one man producer band. So let me, uh, let me get him on deck. Okay. I got him on deck without further ado. Let me welcome Jeff Skunk Baxter to the show. Yay! <laughs> Can you all see him okay? Can you hear us okay? All right, Skunk, hey. you're live. We're live. <laughs> so uh, how's my hey, I'm so how's my goddaughter doing here? Uh, <laughs> yes, y'all. Skunk is my godfather. Um he has gone above and beyond to check in on me and my family since my dad has passed. And I am so grateful for that. So yeah, I, I see people, I'm looking at the chat skunk while we're talking and, and I see, yes, everyone can hear you. Ashley's here. Mom's here. The whole family's here. All right. Awesome. So skunk. Oh, there's so many things that we could talk about today. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to start off this conversation and, and, and do something maybe a little more fun and a little more relaxed than maybe what you're used to. I, I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm in a living room. You're in, you're in a comfy chair and, and uh, I just, well, here's I just, something that I find interesting. What? Roger Nichols was probably for my money, the greatest recorded engineer that ever lived. And here you are as an engineer, engineering your own podcast. I just find that to be del delightfully special. Isn't that cool? It's like I'm kind of finding my, my own voice and my own calling. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, sure. I'm, en I'm engineering human connections. 
Well, that's true. And the fact that uh, you are connected, obviously, to Roger and that Roger played such an important role in Steely Dan. I don't know if the average Steely Dan fan really understands. Yes, the music was really good. Yes, the playing was really good. But it's like the difference, that's all well and good, but somebody has to bridge the music, the playing, to the person who listens to it on the other end. And that was Roger. Just mm. nobody liked him. Nobody. Mm, mm. I heard somebody say at one time on a comment that, um, you know, you had the brains of Steely Dan, but the, but Roger was the uh, thing powering those brains. <laughs> so I That's that a good was, analogy. Isn't that an interesting way to look at it? Because, yeah, he was powering it. I love that analogy. So, uh, yeah, th thanks for saying that. You know, I, I have gotten a lot of great feedback. There actually is, <sighs> excitingly, all these, like, 20-year-old Steely Dan fans, and there's a new crop of Steely Dan fans that, that have really done their research and, and have, you know, learned about Dad and his contributions. And they've been telling me about it, and I think that's actually really beautiful. So somehow the kids, I think, are going to be all right, Skunk. The kids, <laughs> the kids are digging in. <laughs> kids are going to be all right. That's a Peter Townsend quote, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, I mean, this is stuff that you've probably said a million times before, but there's been a lot of early Steely Dan stuff circling the airwaves lately. And my channel, you know, we really love all the backstories. We love the history. So if you could just give us a synopsis about how you teamed up with Steely Dan in those early days, that would be so much fun to talk about. Do you feel good about sure? You know, giving us that that little history that you've probably said a million times, but we'd love to hear it. How'd you find sure. these guys? How'd they find you? Well, I was living in Boston. This was back in 68, 69. And I was working at a recording studio called Intermedia Sound. Uh, I wasn't the house guitar player, but I was hanging out there a lot and ended up playing on a lot of different people's records and demos and other, you know, musical endeavors. Um, and there was a, a band that were, these guys were very good friends of mine, named The Bead Game. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it was a gentleman named Gary Katz who was producing this band. And somehow or other, uh, I guess, obviously because I knew, especially John Sheldon, who was a guitar player in the band, great player, um, had introduced us. And then I guess I was doing a, a session uh, with someone else. And I'm trying to remember who it was, uh, Paul Pina or... Jonathan Edwards, uh, I, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess Gary had stuck his head in. And afterwards, we, you know, ended up, you know, we met in uh, the hallway of the studios. And he said, listen, uh, I'm producing this a wonderful lady singer named Linda Hoover in New York. Would you be interested in playing on her project mm -hmm. and i was commuting back and forth i was living in boston but i was commuting to new york to do sessions uh and so i said well sure you know no problem and when i went down there i met donald fagan and walter becker who had written a good chunk of the material on linda hoover's record and when I asked them about it, they said, I, I said, well, this music is really amazing. Right? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we've never heard anybody play this music like you do. Would you someday be interested in forming a band? And I said, sure. And so we made a sort of a pact that <laughs> the first person that got anything close to a record deal 
would alert everyone else. <laughs> and uh, what was interesting uh-huh. is Jimmy Hodder was the drummer for the beat game. And when we started to assemble what ended up becoming Steely Dan, uh, Jimmy became the drummer because we were looking for a drummer. And David Palmer was a friend of mine. Uh, Ricky Phelps was another great guitar player. And, and I had met him in New York doing sessions. And so when we were looking for someone as a lead singer, I recommended Dave Palmer. And of course, you can hear him sing on this first Steely Dan record. It's pretty, he's a pretty amazing singer. Mm-hmm. So the band built up. Uh, Denny Diaz, the other guitar player in the band, was good friends with, I believe, both uh, Becker and Fagan. Mm-hmm. And that kind of rounded things out. There we were. Now, we were rehearsing in the, because Gary Katz had negotiated a publishing deal with ABC Dunhill Records. And Uh so that was the camel's nose under the tent. I said, if the first person gets anything close to a record deal, call everybody. Here we go. So I happened to be (laughs) in California. Uh, Jimmy moved to California. And so did Dave Palmer. And we didn't really have a place to rehearse. So we started rehearsing in the office of the president of ABC Records. Um, Jay Lasker and usually we would rehearse at night and then we'd clean up our stuff and get out of there before Jay showed up for work but I from what I remember <laughs> we'd had a, a a night of uh, celebration and libation and didn't manage to get our equipment broken down quickly enough and so Jay Lasker came into his office and said, what the hell is this? Oh, no. <laughs> and we said, well, and Gary said, well, there's this band. <laughs> and uh, maybe you ought to listen to him. And Jay and Howard Stark, who was his partner, said, okay, we'll listen to it. And that's kind of how it all got started. Ooh, I love and, it. So, so y'all are rehearsing. And, so you haven't met dad yet, right? Or is he, he's around ABC at the time. Right, right. He's a, not a house engineer. He's like mm-hmm. staff engineer. Mm-hmm. And so I remember we were all sitting around trying to figure out a name for the band. Yeah. <laughs> and it really settled into two different names. One was Big Nardo in the eighth grade. <laughs> But we all decided that was too long and probably couldn't fit it on an album cover. And somebody suggested Steely Dan. And because, you know, we, we were all East Coast kids. We'd all gone to some fairly decent schools. I went to prep school. Oh, English literature was uh, a strong foundation for all of us. So... Mm-hmm. We had all read William Burroughs' work. Uh, we'd all read Naked Lunch. I mean, we were at Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer. I mean, that whole underground author um, revolution there in the 60s. So someone suggested Steely Dan from William Burroughs' novel Naked Lunch. And we all went, that's nice. Let's do that. And then the first song that we released as Steely Dan, was a song called Dallas. Very cool song. Very catchy, very cool song. But I'm not sure. I think it was Walter Becker that convinced Donald and the record company to pull it. Because, number one, since it was was a lot of steel guitar, and it it was kind of a country tune. Mm. as only Steely Dan can do country. But it was kind of a country tune. And I think they were worried that people would think that Steely Dan was a country band. Mm. So they pulled that. And then the first, I guess, large release was 
do it again. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the rest is history. Mm. Dallas, have have has that surfaced? Has anybody heard that? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you can go online and hear it. As a matter of fact, Poco covered it. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm like, what else can I find in my dad's garage? I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm on a, <laughs> I'm on a winning streak right now. I'm like, what else can we dig That's out it. of there? <laughs> oh, the rest is history. I love it. I love it. So there you are. And, um, you, you guys got paired with dad, right? So it was time to start recording. So you guys were rehearsing and it was time to start recording stuff. And then that's when you all met dad, right? Roger Nichols. Right. Okay. And so y'all are at ABC recording, correct? Let me see if I have my history. Yeah. Okay. ABC records had their own recording studio. And then, um, was it the second album you went to Cherokee or when did you guys start to migrate? Cause you did wrote one album at Cherokee studios at the ranch, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I'm, I'm wondering if we did, boy, what has a East St. Louis toodle do or where, where's my East St. Louis toodle Toodaloo. Which, which was a song by Duke Ellington. Okay. Was an instrumental. And because all of us in Steely Dan were avid jazz fans, um, I grew up listening to Duke Ellington because my dad had a fantastic record collection. Mm. So I listened to all of that music. And um, <laughs> I'm just trying to think. Pretzel Logic. Yeah. We did that song. Uh, I think Donald picked it out. And the idea was, okay, we're going to do this song, and each person is going to pick one instrument from the original track and play it. So uh, Walter on guitar picked the trombone. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry. He picked the trumpet with a, a mute, with a wah-wah mute. Mm -hmm. And I picked the trombone. And it was interesting transcribing the trombone solo for pedal steel guitar. But what the hell? You know, why not? Especially because the pedal steel had being, being able to play with a steel bar, you could slide. You know. But... Also, the idea was, let's pick something difficult. We're pretty good players, and let's see what we can do. And that's kind of how that came about. And, and Roger and I, as soon as we met, we hit it off because both of us had a love for physics, science, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and later in life, I had brought Roger into some of the things that I did that were not for like commercial music. I was at Lawrence Livermore, uh, the National Laboratory, and a number of other things, and I brought Roger in. It's like, <laughs> you talk about peas in a pod. Mm. Roger was so brilliant. He contributed so much. A lot of things we can never talk about. Ooh. Ah, and that's the stuff we want to talk about. Is that going to be in your book? Wait, uh -huh. can we talk about it when you retire? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no. no, you already know the answer to some of this. So, okay, yeah, we can't talk. What about if it. you wrote it on a piece of paper and hid it somewhere in the house and then no, just, kidding. <laughs> just kidding? Okay, okay, <laughs> just kidding. Actually, okay, I love that you and dad had so much in common besides not just Steely Dan, but you did. You had so much in common where you guys could start, you guys really could understand each other and um, get into deep conversations about the physics of sound. And you do a lot of, you do a lot of chats. Like you've had panels at South by Southwest and you've been asked to speak. And maybe we're getting to this a little too early, but um, you know, I, I really love when you start to, talk about the physics of sound being into sound therapy myself. Is there, is there something that you really remember taking deep dives with dad on when you, when you guys would like kick that around or I don't know. Well, we started to talk about the relationship between sound and color. Uh, that was, and that was easy because uh, we both understood 
the relationship in terms of where on the frequency spectrum those different entities would lay. Uh, sound was in the lower part of the frequency spectrum and color, light, was in the upper part of the frequency spectrum. And I remember when I went to radar school the first time, uh, when I was uh, working for Uncle Sam, uh, I, the, the professor, first thing he did is he played Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor. And then he played Pink Floyd. I thought, okay, you know, I'm sitting in there with a bunch of second lieutenants and captains. And I was thinking this is gonna be terrible, but this turned out to be great. And he began to explain the reason that he played that music is because he wanted people to understand the relationship between color and sound. Uh, radars work at very high frequencies. And if you are at all familiar with music and especially playing stringed instruments, you're familiar with harmonics. Uh, and if you're familiar with harmonics, then you begin to understand how you climb up the frequency scale from zero to light, the pure energy on the other end. Um, so human ears can hear here because you're, you're basically a human being as a sensor package. You have different sensors that can, that can pick up different parts of the frequency spectrum. Your ears can pick up part of it. Your skin can pick up part of it as heat. Your eyes can pick up part of it as color. So depending on where you are in that continuum. So your ears can hear from about 20 cycles, which means a one cycle is the time it takes for a particular frequency to go from a standing start to a completed waveform. That's one cycle. Mm -hmm. So from 20 cycles to about 20,000 cycles, a human being can hear those frequencies. Uh, women can hear higher frequencies than men and animals, especially dogs, can hear up to 40,000 cycles, 45,000 cycles. Then it tapers off because your body doesn't have the sensor capability. Meanwhile, you're creeping up the spectrum and then all of a sudden you get into the infrared part of the spectrum and you can feel it on your skin as heat. Mm -hmm. Then as you pass from, and you know the colors of the rainbow, mm -hmm. when you pass into red, then you pass into yellow, green and blue. And then again, your eyes, because they lack the ability to pick up those frequencies they're limited in the in the it, by that's what we call the, the rainbow and then it goes into x-rays ultra high frequency stuff uh but i remember the professor said i just want you guys to know he was a guitar player he said would you strike an a string on a guitar it vibrates at 440 times a second in other words, it goes through 440 complete cycles every second. And you hear that as the note A below middle C. If you multiply that times 10 to the 23rd power, the super harmonic of A440 is the color green. So immediately I thought, oh, I thought about Roger. I said, we used to sit around and talk about this, the relationships. So that means that A440 is a subharmonic of the color green. So when you look at green, the color, whether it's in nature or wool or a painting, you're actually connected to sound, the subharmonic of that. And so the lower parts of the frequency spectrum, when you get below 20 cycles, uh, things begin to get interesting. <laughs> mm. uh, I remember some of my colleagues, we hooked up a passive radiator transducer to a stage one time, bolted it on, <laughs> and used the frequency generator to get down to about five cycles per second 
Ooh, and five over, hertz, right? Is that five, five hertz? Five hertz right? Okay, five hertz. And our, our eyeballs started to float. Uh, so there's no doubt of the physical um, effects of the lower frequencies. And certainly you've gone to live shows where you feel the thumping of the bass. You feel the bottom end of the music. And it's because those waveforms can sometimes be hundreds of feet wide. The distance between the, the top of the waveform and when it goes back to the zero point could be hundreds of feet. It can even be as someone has now won the Nobel Prize for detecting gravity waves, which emanated from the Big Bang of the universe when it first uh, came into existence. Those frequencies are so low and there could be hundreds of miles between Mm. The, the the zero point of the frequency and when the cycle completes or the half cycle because it always goes up down below and then back up again that's a complete cycle so there's no doubt in anybody's mind that music and color and sound and light it's all part of the same continuum and it's the glue Frequency is the glue that holds matter together. So there you go. Mm. And your research into sound therapy, mm -hmm. every, every piece of matter has a, uh, a harmonic, will vibrate at a certain note, a certain frequency. And so parts of your body, because the cells are made slightly differently, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, different cells make up different parts of your body, uh, will vibrate differently. There's a tremendous amount of research now looking at what if you were able to narrow down into the, um, the, uh, the vibrational frequency of a cancer cell, which is different than the vibrational frequency of a normal body cell, you might be able to crank up the volume and kill it. Uh, <clears throat> frequencies also stimulate uh, the endorphins in your brain, the neurotransmitters that are responsible for your emotions. Epinephrine, adrenaline, oxytocin, vasopressin, a number of, of these neurotransmitters that basically dictate your mood. And mm -hmm. so there are certain frequencies that tri trigger the secretion of those neurotransmitters. When Bach, Stoccata, and Fugue in D minor was first performed, they probably should have waited to the end of the church service because they played it in the beginning and they burned the church to the ground scared the crap out of everybody. And then Stravinsky went, oh yeah, I like that. So he writes the, the Rite of Spring and incorporates the same harmonic uh, combination as Bach did. And it <clears throat> was eventually called the Devil's Interval by the Catholic Church. The dominant tone, the flat five, in other words, the fifth, note of the scale flatted down a half step and then the dominant note again it's all odd harmonics there's no even harmonics basically what it does is it drives you batshit odd harmonics odd harmonics which is one of the reasons why uh digital recording has certain problems because when uh digital frequencies when a transistor goes into distortion it generates odd harmonics when analog tube amplifiers go into distortion it generates even harmonics i mean i'm sure you've heard people say oh you know analog is so warm and so yeah well the warmth comes from your body going yeah i like that as opposed to i don't like that it's okay. all connected okay so this is where 
Yes, I I've heard that conversation. Now, I'm just trying to think of like what dad said in regards to digital audio, because he wasn't necessarily like saying record everything in digital. He was saying, make sure if you record an analog, just move it straight away to digital. And he was all about trying to get the cleanest sound to everybody. That's correct. So like I understand analog has some warmth to it. And my dad wasn't I mean, my dad was actually a big brat about it. He was like, no analog. He called it anal -og. <laughs> analog because he was a big digital guy. But it's well, that has well, been a discussion with Steely Dan stuff, the warmth versus the sterileness and like, I don't know. Well, much of the early Steely Dan stuff was recorded analog was recorded on magnetic tape versus being recorded onto a, um, a, a, a glop of digital memory. Mm. And Roger, uh, to his credit, it's not that he didn't like analog. What he didn't like was the fact that the, um, the, um, the, the 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 space between being you know the, the the amount and the gain that you could record the noise floor was low digital uh, analog music generated hiss I guess is the best word for it a sort of a you know you can hear top ends hissing it's just the nature of the beast. And that's why Thomas Dolby, not Thomas Dolby, but uh, Mr. Dolby created Dolby sound reduction to remove that or a, move, a portion of it. And DBX, the same thing. People were striving to be able to remove as much of the noise as possible to be able to preserve what the good parts of analog. So it's not that Roger didn't like analog. It's that for a, a purist like Roger, it was the only way to remove all that analog noise. Mm -hmm. And then it was also about moving it into digital as soon as possible because the tape degrades and it loses. Absolutely. The, and editing. Uh... And editing. And, I mean, used to be when I was producing records when we would want to make, you know, after we made a record, we want to make another record out of it. We go into the studio, go to Cherokee with a bottle of scotch and a box of razor blades. We get about you know eight or ten reels of tape, and we slice and dice and make songs. <laughs> now, it's basically like word processing. Oh, uh, thank you, Eric. We just we're getting so many shout outs in the chat. By the way, I just I have to I have to give a, a shout out, Eric B. Just said, this is amazing with a huge heart. Everybody is so delighted that you're here, Skunk. Um, and we have questions coming later. But yeah, I just wanted to just say thank you, everyone, to the chat. Uh, Skunk can't see the chat, but I, I do have Chad here helping me today. And he's going to uh, get all your questions and put them in a place for me to look at later so we can ask Skunk all your questions while you're here. But Everyone's and also, I want to thank everybody for supporting Simpson. She's uh, one of the most <laughs> wonderful people on the planet, my goddaughter. So everybody out there, keep doing it. W watch this space. Because Simpson, I think, has just uh, kind of found her, found her groove here. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, we're having a good time. We're having a good time. Oh, yeah. And, you know, they appreciate history like I do. Like, look, I've been looking at my dad's archives for about a decade now. And full disclosure, I wasn't like, sorry, I don't know how to say this. I, I wasn't a Steely Dan fan in the sense that I listened to all their stuff over and over again. That was my dad. That was my dad's work. But looking at his stuff for the past decade, I've gained an appreciation for it that I didn't have as a teenager. And I mean, you know, I, I was listening to my own stuff as a teenager, but being able to kind of talk about the history with you, Skunk, and other people around, it's been so gratifying for me, especially after digging through all my dad's stuff. Like when he was here, we started to archive some of his stuff, but it wasn't until he passed that I really dug into his boxes and 
started pulling things out and finding some really amazing things that now I get to share with people because there's people excited to see it. I'm stoked. <laughs> Skunk, did you have any idea that this new Danissance was coming? H have you have you heard any of the chatter happening now and the and the excitement for Steely Dan? What do you think about that? Well, I've heard a little bit or met more than a little bit, but what I think of it is <clears throat> well, it certainly beats being a serial killer. I mean, you know, it's nice to have people like your legacy for <laughs> for the good and enjoyment and pleasure, et cetera, et cetera. And it's nice that nice is the wrong word. It's gratifying that people mm. appreciate what we did. In a lot of ways, we weren't really sure what we were doing. I mean, we're young kids. We're just doing what we think we should do and what we like to do. I don't think we sat back and said, many years from now, when people look back on the history of music, Steely Dan will have a prominent role in defining the music of the, I mean, no, no way. But it is very gratifying and very satisfying. Yeah, yeah, right? You guys are having fun, but okay, that's actually another reason to love what you did is because y'all, and I, I've heard dad say this too, you all were making those records for yourselves. That perfectionism and that drive and the desire to, you know, invent things in the studio and fix things that weren't broken was for y'all's enjoyment because you thought you could make things better that's kind of cool well and we tried to bring our skills uh <clears throat> as best we could um i had been a studio musician already for some years before we formed steely dan and to me you start with perfection and you work your way up now the caveat to that is sometimes perfection is the enemy because if you concentrate too much on perfection, sometimes you might lose the soul part of it. Some performances may not be perfect, but those performances may be the magic ones. Because, uh, and any <clears throat> physicist will tell you, that time is not linear. It actually moves in a spiral. You never, unless somehow or other you can figure out a way to orbit the event horizon of a black hole and get back into time. And then we can sit here and discuss wormholes, time, string theory, and that's a whole other thing. But if, if you can't do that, time moves in a spiral. So you never get back to the same spot. So you may try to recreate a performance, but you'll never get back there. You may be able to recreate it from a, from a musically technical note by note point of view, but emotion is a very, very fanciful thing. And emotion is, is on that spiraling timeline. But we brought our skills and I brought all my skills that I had and I was still doing sessions while we were doing all the Steely Dan records. So it was a golden opportunity to bring what I was learning and a good studio musician, studio musician learns every day, every session you learn something. Mm. So to bring those skills and bring that knowledge to the band, which was the center of our universe at the time. Oh, that's so good. Okay, wait, can we go back to serial killers? <laughs> So, fun fact, I don't know how many people know this. Let me know in the chat. But Cherokee Ranch was next to an infamous other ranch back in the day. Yes. Uh, does anybody know what I'm referencing? I'll give you a second to answer here. But um, Cherokee Ranch, Cherokee Studios was uh, started by the Rob brothers. And, and dad, Roger Nichols, helped 
them build the studio in his yeah. off time, whatever that was. <clears throat> um, and I uh, eventually brought Steely Dan there to record Pretzel Logic. So I think we're in like 73, 70. Around there, yeah. 70, 72, 73. So, uh, Yep, Billy. Yep, we got it. Manson's Ranch, Sp Blue Sky, Spawn, Spawn Driving Spawn Right. Yep, Spawn yeah. Ranch. So, yes, Cherokee Studios, where Steely Dan was recording Pretzel Logic, was right next door to Spawn Ranch, which was skunk. What was Spawn Ranch? <laughs> well, at one time, and I'm sure a lot of the folks out there have seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the movie the Tarantino movie. Spawn Ranch was a, uh, a movie set or, and a TV set. It was a place where um, uh, uh, media companies went to stage, to stage, basically. Mm -hmm. um, outdoor stage to stage, you know, anything that had to do with Old West or, or anything. And <laughs> so... Let's see. So you guys are out there during Pretzel Logic. And yeah. when did you realize that it was... I mean, at that point, Manson and that whole family, they weren't uh, America's number one suspects yet. So it was just a bunch of wild kids next door, right? Like, did you know something was up or were you guys... No, the only thing that we knew was Roger and I were outside... Uh, outside the studio, you know, outdoors. Uh -huh. And a couple of bullets came zinging by. <gasps> oh, no. So Roger and I thought, okay, perhaps we should respond to this. <laughs> and we did. And I'll just leave it at that. Oh, no. What a wild time in the industry of Y'all lived in what I consider to be the golden era of the recording industry. Like, talk about the wild, wild west. Steely Dan out in Cherokee Studios recording to what would, you know, be uh, infamous, in an infamous situation. That's so wild. That's I know. I remember we were trying to deaden, you know, deaden the walls of one of the, one of the, you know, one of the walls of the studio. Uh -huh. So we knocked a hole in the outside and we started to fill it with cement. And we couldn't understand why we were using so much cement. Mm -hmm. And so we went into the studio and realized that we'd broken through the wall inside and filled up the 24-track machine with cement. So what? we had to start all over again. Yeah. Yep. Oh, no. You... <laughs> I should get. I, I need to get Bruce. We should Bruce get Bruce Donaldson. out here. Yeah, yeah, oh, no, Bruce I'll, I'll Donaldson. No, Bruce yeah. Rob or Bruce. Is there another well, Bruce? Bruce Rob, Bruce Donaldson. They they were the Rob brothers. Was right. The name okay. of their band. Um, because we you guys got some great stories. Oh yeah. yeah, they had some great stories. I'll have to get him on. He's actually still doing Cherokee Studios. They opened up a new little studio down in Hollywood, but. That was the time. The ranch before it moved to Fairfax and David Bowie worked there and everything. Uh, so yeah, Pretzel Logic. He's got a few great stories about you guys recording Pretzel Logic and dad using um, dad using his head to make the gong sound. Uh, I don't know if you're around for any of that, but yeah, I'll bring him oh, yeah. on. Um, oh, yeah. well, well, so I have got um, a friend in the chat. Oh, by the way, what? just want to mention that the, the studio that, uh, Bruce had built uh, down on Melrose Avenue. Mm -hmm. It's probably the finest recording studio in Los Angeles. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. The one, Cherokee's, the current one, right? The, the current, current one. Yep. It's basically a recreation of Studio One from on the one that was on Fairfax, with a uh, beautiful Trident A range console, et cetera, et cetera. I've done a bunch of recording down there. It's just fantastic. So just a, uh, a good plug for those guys. Yeah, that's a great plug. Well, so you know what? I'm going to give us a few minutes. You know what I'd like to play right now? I, for those that haven't seen this, Skunk, you've been aware of uh, the Midnight Special posting old Steely Dan band 
yeah videos okay they're so good they are so good i i I'm going to take a break right now. Um, give us a few minutes. I'm going to play for the chat. My old school uh, by the minute special. And then uh, we're, I want to talk about your new album and we'll play your, your rendition of my old school. I'm so excited about that. Okay. So uh, here we go. Chat. I am going to share screen and we're going to play. We're going to take a five minute break here and, and watch Skunk shred on the guitar. Yes. Uh, that was amazing. I think we're back. Okay, Skunk, you are live. You're back with us. Uh, that was amazing. Have you seen that footage lately? Have you seen it I before? Have. I have, yeah. yeah. What do you think about that? It, it newly surfaced, right? I feel like it's a newer... 10 days ago. 10 days ago that was shared with the world. Yeah, I've been seeing a number of uh, videos from Midnight Special and uh, uh, rock concert and different stuff. It's again, it's it's satisfying and fun to see what you were like when you were, you know, <laughs> young and crazy. It's now so I'm old good. and crazy. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's so good. I mean, well, you're, you're sweet. How much fun is that to see live? I, I mean, you look. For a band that was a band, and then things changed. You migrated to Doobie Brothers, brought along Michael McDonald, which is a whole other conversation. But um, and then thing th th this Steely Dan went underground for a decade. So I mean, like, it's a totally different vibe, and it's so fun. And both both Steely Dan's are great, but but I love that all this old footage is surfacing lately. Do you remember anything about that show? That you want to tell us about or I mean, it's like 50 years ago now so it's all right if you don't remember well <laughs> it's hard because uh there were for a certain length of time i was in the house band as well so we would do a number of different um acts and i'm trying to remember i think i was working uh that day we started at like eight in the morning and then the, the, the live acts, I mean, the, then the bands would come on later. You know, we were doing single artists at the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, it all kind of folds into a blur because I can't remember which chart was for what song for which artist. But um, all I, I do remember uh, that we were really excited because our background singers and, of course, Royce Jones, one of the Boy, talk about a talented, talented singer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when we did when we did the sound check, I was like, oh "My God, this sounds incredible!" Because I thought it was going to sound terrible. And of course, uh, uh, Donald and to a greater extent Walter Becker were less than enthusiastic about playing live anywhere mm -hmm. and they thought it was going to be a disaster and looks like things worked out very well things worked out great i mean you could as a performer like i i look for the details and i i can see a little bit of nerves in donald and stuff but you are and the singers yeah y'all seasoned pros just lose having a great time and it really comes through on the video uh Okay, so speaking of the 70s, <laughs> uh, 
I, I'm going to play. I'm going to do one more screen share and then we're going to get into your album. But I just uncovered and posted online for everybody to see the 1972-ish Schlitz beer commercial. Oh, yes. <laughs> She <laughs> began foray into the commercial world. Okay, okay. I'm gonna play that for everybody if if they haven't seen it already, because I I have some great slides and stuff on there. But can you tell us a little bit about the beer commercial and how that manifested and what you remember from that whole situation? <laughs> well, what I do remember is like at that time <laughs> there were a number of bands that were attempting to and actually being successful <clears throat> at getting involved in selling product. Um, I remember Richie Havens, who was an old friend, called me one time. He said, they're, uh, they're going to, you know, they've asked me to do this jingle commercial. I said, I don't want to do it. I don't want to sell out. Of course, I've been doing jingles for years as a studio musician and said, Richie, just do it. It's like a 30 second hit record. It's like a challenge. It's creative. And I think you'll enjoy it. And I think the first, the ultimately he got about $400,000 in residuals from that. And then he called me and said, yeah, skunk, I think you're right. I said, you didn't sell out. You just were opened up one more facet of your creativity. So for Steely Dan to do a commercial about any product, obviously there was a flavor to it that was, you know, unique to Steely Dan. And yes, I believe Donald was not, was worried that some advertising person would come in and write the commercial. So his, his uh his he insisted that that steely dan be right and be the commercial uh, and a lot of it was of course walter and donald's uh, input so <laughs> yeah uh, and walter had decided that the best way to do this was to get a tank of helium and and to have me speak do the commercial in Spanish because I grew up in Mexico, so I speak fluent Spanish. Uh -huh. And then he, then Don would act as the sort of the uh, the Greek chorus, uh, you know, to to channel the Spanish into English. And I guess for a number of reasons, I thought it was kind of cool. We all thought it was kind of cool. <laughs> But so from, good. <laughs> from what I gather, uh, the word grab in Spanish, and by the way, for those out there who are writing on this, it's the verb coger, which is C-O-J-E-R mm -hmm. um, for everybody, um, also has an analog to performing a sexual act. So perhaps somewhere in the mix, somebody in the world of crazy censorship when everything was, you know, everybody was so frightened of any kind of anything being shown or said. We had the same problem with the lyrics to Showbiz Kids hmm. where they had to censor out one of the words. What word? Well, it was the F word. Showbiz Kids? Wait. Making movies of themselves, you know, they don't give up. About uh, anybody. Okay. Else. So we had to censor that out. I mean, everybody was so uptight. Mm -hmm. So I believe this is the the demise of the uh, of the stillborn um, situation with that commercial. Probably was a victim mm -hmm. of that kind of censorship. And you we had, had fun. you had so the the Spanish came from there was a song that you had just worked on where you used Spanish on what song was that. Only a fool would say that. Only yeah. a fool. So you had done the Spanish, it's on the outro, and then yeah. they went, oh, yeah. hey. And then that was the idea for this. I guess so. Okay. I, I Unfortunately, I, 
All right. Well, my notes are not as complete as they should be. So that's too. all right. Yeah, it's all right. No, we're working. We're we're piecing it together. We, we have, we have a uh, so much fun stuff to show here. Anyway, okay. So I, I I'm actually gonna play it. Let's play it. Let's play this video for people who haven't seen yet. And I actually added slides from a photo shoot you guys did with Dad, and we'll talk about that really quick after. Cuando yo regreso de un día muy duro de trabajo. When I get home from a hard day's work. Yo cojo por todos los ambientes que puedo. He says he likes to crowd for all the gusto he can get. ¿Por qué solo se hace la vuelta una vez nada más? Because you only go around one time. Okay. Okay. Once around life. Once around beer, once around beer and keep the roundness. Come along and take the best that life's given. Once around beer and you keep the roundness. When you're out of shape. We've been this good on the floor. You're out of shape. When you're out of shape. Okay, we're back. That was amazing. Let me stop it. Wait, oh, it's playing again. That okay, skunk. <laughs> That's a really good commercial. Pues ándale, pues fuimos grabando con ganas. I thought it was pretty good, you know. It's such a like. Of course, Steely Dan would be extra and make the best sounding jingle of all time. <laughs> pretty cool. Well yeah. done. Yeah, and so I found a photo shoot that my dad had did for you guys. Um, do you remember anything about this photo shoot? Y'all are on the street of Hollywood Boulevard in front of a, uh, is it a pussycat theater? Is that the politically correct way to say? <laughs> uh, I think it was a an establishment that um, was a retail outlet for uh, um, um, explicit literature and photographs. Yeah. yeah, and there's this great photo of you on the light pole with your leg up, and there's a adult movie theater behind you, and you got Donald and Walter right next to you. I think that was the photo shoot for the cover of Can't Buy a Throw. Right. Yeah. And it didn't make it because there was some questionable situations happening, I think, with Gary Katz's kids, and the record company was like, um... Y'all are doing something that'll probably get us in trouble. So, see how many times, <laughs> like it, this, this podcast is becoming a history of censorship oh, and no. small mindedness. That's, yeah, it's true though. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, thankfully, though, I, I started archiving. I actually started archiving these slides when Dad was alive. In 2009, I saw Dad had boxes of pictures, and I went, what is all this stuff? And we started to go through it, and I, and I saw some of these pictures, and I was like, Dad, these are great. We have to start scanning them. And, and he actually started scanning them and telling me who people were. And So, yeah, this is one of the photo shoots that got saved, saved from the boxes. It's so good. Well, so let's talk about your album and then we'll get into questions and wrap it up for the day. Uh, I'm so excited. Uh, you know, you released your first solo album. Was it last year? 
did last year did it finally get released to the wild not too long ago right not too long ago yeah yep not too long ago we we finally have a skunk baxter record you you have been you know supporting and being the guitar god but well this you're is your... very kind i know better than that but that's because you're my goddaughter okay well i, I appreciate think, it and by i the think way, you're like a god <clears throat> i want to take uh this is a good opportunity of uh, the, the the person that i work with uh very closely on this project is a gentleman named cj Vanston, an yes. incredible keyboard player CJ. producer uh uh writer uh so his input on this was uh, extremely important. So I just want to make sure that everybody understands and gives him credit for a lot of what made this record as yes. what it is. CJ is a powerhouse in his own right. And thank you so much for reminding me. Of course, CJ Vanston, a keyboard god, um, produced and partnered with you on this album. Uh, and and y'all are actually, you've been touring, uh, and you're, you're touring again this coming August. Yeah, we'll do a quick West coast tour. We've already done the East coast, North, uh, Japan, and then we'll do a quick, uh, another West coast tour. We did one already and we're going to do just maybe five or six or seven shows. Great. That's awesome. I love it. I saw you at the Troubadour. Anybody in the West Coast, he's playing at the Troubadour. Uh, I can tell you right now, he's playing at the Troubadour in West Hollywood, August 22nd. So get your tickets. It's a great show. And um, I want to play for our friends here. So you did a couple of Steely Dan. um, What are they? Not a cover. I mean, you were in Steely Dan. So what is it called? Uh, your version <laughs> like, well you're covering yeah, we your own stuff <laughs> we did an iteration an iteration again. okay that's because a good one. as you could see if you listen to the original track on the, on the album and then you see the live performance you can see that the live performance at least from what i can tell has a lot more energy than the original track and mm-hmm. um, after a while, uh, Donald had asked me to sing the, my old school uh, when we were playing live mm-hmm. for whatever reason. So between that and feeling that the song could handle a lot, mu- uh, a much more energetic performance, I uh, went back and wrote an arrangement of it. And with a, what I believe to be a lot more energy, of course, you all can. Um... Uh oh, did we lose Skunk? Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, well, this would be a good time for. Uh, I think Skunk dropped out. Skunk. So I'm going to play what he was talking about. So this is. There he is. So he called me back and he said, well, yeah, this is pretty cool. I said, so, but who's singing it? I said, well, that's me. So you, yeah. sk- you can you hear me, Skunk? Yeah. You dropped out for a second, but basically you said that Donald asked, uh, so you had sung My Old School Live, and you did. Yeah. You recorded this for your album. Because and- of, of the, I, 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 I did a much more energetic version because you could see from the, the Midnight Special performance, this song rocked. Yeah. I think a lot more than we rocked it on the on the original album so yeah so i i i we did the the uh, track and i did a scratch vocal sent it to steve tyler steve called me back and he said well yeah but uh uh, who's singing it i said well i'm singing it i'm just doing a scratch vocal here for you he said well why don't you sing it i said well what are you kidding and he said yeah why don't you it sounds good to me i said are you shitting me and Steve's a friend, and he said, no, I'm telling you, you need to do this. Okay, well, you know a lot more about this than I do, kind Steve, of stuff. Steve Tyler, like Steven Tyler from Aerosmith? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> so, so I said, okay, I'll take a shot. And uh, I forgot to put it, maybe it was just my own, um, you know, I don't really think of myself as a singer. 
so I forgot to put it on. I forgot to credit myself on the album. But uh, it seems to have worked out very well. People love it. It's rocking and moving and, I don't know, kind of cool. I love it. All right, well, let's play it. I'm going to play it from Tidal. I'm going to stream it right now. Tidal is actually one of the best um, streaming platforms. Tidal and Apple Music pay their art. This is my my own personal soapbox. They they pay their artists the best of all streaming, So, which is still little, but... Anyway, that's why I'm playing it from Tidal right now. I just, I've been having fun using Tidal lately. So here we go. My old school. Yes! Oh, it's such a rocking tune! I was like, I was up every, dancing. We have friends in the chat. They're so excited. They said that song was rocking. They were dancing. It's a lot of fun live. So for those of you on the West Coast, check out skunk's website you can find jeff scott baxter.com tour dates and i highly recommend it oh, God. you guys you did such a good job well I'm, thank you dear i'm so proud of you uh, well i'm really proud of you doing this podcast this is great people are having fun we're talking about some history talking about things kind of off you know the cuff or the sound therapy stuff is really cool. I appreciate you talking about that. And, and you know, we have some questions from the chat. So, Oh, by the way, uh, the organ solo on that is David Page. David Page is the organ from solo. Toto, from Toto. Okay. When I, when I told David that I was doing a solo record, he said, well, what are you doing? What kind of stuff are you doing? I said, well, do maybe a couple of Steely Dan tunes, uh, uh, kind of a whacked out, twisted, some, um, you know, sleazy version of Do It Again. And we were going to do Miles, my old school. And he said, I'm playing the organ solo. Yes. I went, sure. <laughs> of course. I mean, we've been friends for 100 years, done a million sessions together. So I said, sure, you got it. You have, yeah, so many great tracks. Everybody, go stream Skunk's album. It's called The Speed of Heat, uh, Speed of Heat. Speed of heat. And this is this is maybe a little aside, but yeah. uh, a kind of a tribute to Roger. Um, speed of heat is the aerodynamic and thermodynamic phenomenon that happens when uh, something is moving towards Mach one, the speed of sound. And uh, CJ is a big aviation buff, and on my in my day job, I do a lot of things with things that go fast and go boom. So I spend a lot of my time in that arena. Mm -hmm. So if you look on the album cover, you'll notice there's a bunch of equations behind me. And I remember when we first released the record, I got a call from one of my colleagues at North of Grumman who said, Skunk, I know what that is. I said, what is that? He says, those are oblong pressure wave equations, right? I went, yep. You got it. Speed of heat. So I love it. Roger would have, for wherever he is, he's probably laughing his ass off at that because only somebody like Roger would have understood what that was, other than, you know, my friends in the aerospace industry. So. Mm -hmm. But a yeah. person who crossed over music and engineering. Uh -huh. So anyway, I there love you go, it. Raj. Yay. The speed of heat. I love it. Okay. So we're going to get to a few questions and then wrap it up for today. I'm so grateful that you were able to come on. Everybody in the chat has had so much fun. So thank you so much for spending your time with us. Um, let's My get to pleasure. the questions. So Chad, Chad, our moderator for today has a question. Skunk, was the pick scrape in the solo in Change of the Guard planned or spontaneous? And whose idea was it? Purely spontaneous. Just decided when you're playing, if you're if you're if you're doing it right, you're in a place, a mental state that psychologists call flow, where you really have removed the physical the conscious barriers between you, whatever the, whatever you is, the definition of you as an individual person and your fingers. So you just 
do what you feel is right. So that's kind of how that happened. Pretty much that way with everything. I mean, there are times when there are when you compose things. The solo on Ricky, don't lose that number. I really sat down and composed that because there were certain elements that I wanted to create, both the blues feel and then morph into a little bit more of a um, uh, jazz is probably a, a, not a perfect word for it, but going to a, a different melodic style than the normal blues pentatonic scale. So I pretty much thought about that. But <clears throat> the answer to your question is, I was just at the moment. Mm, okay, thank you. Yes, and someone said that the solo on Ricky Don't Lose That Number is their favorite solo of all time. Sorry, oh, Larry. Very Larry. Kind. And then they apologized to Larry Carlton. So there you go. <laughs> well, that's very kind. And, okay. and I love Larry too, believe me. Yeah, it. yeah. Uh, so, okay, now we have um, XEBO6 says, what is the best guitar and why is it the Telecaster? <laughs> well, that's an interesting, uh, you know. It's I, really I, I, hard I, to pick, right? I, mean, like, I would uh, say, yeah. What's the best car? Yeah. What's I, the best aircraft? Depends, depends. What's the best single malt scotch? I mean, I think this is a question of preference. Mm -hmm. And because guitars are the interface between your musical creativity and reproducing it, it really, the good news is that there are uh, a number of different kinds that you can avail yourself of to bring out the best in you. Uh, it's interesting that they would say the Telecaster. The guitar that I played on the Midnight Special is a Telecaster body, which I actually had to glue together because I dumpster dived it out at Fender at the Fender factory out in Corona years ago because I was building and repairing guitars. Wait, so, I, so the guitar on the Midnight Special was a dumpster dive that yeah. you that you Frankenstein together. Yeah, and and and, <laughs> and then I, I I stripped the finish off, but I used a little too much industrial strip, so I had to re-glue the pieces together. But yeah, those are Skunkle Sonic pickups, and it's a very, it's not a Telecaster. I love the Telecaster. I think it's a wonderful instrument. Uh, my probably my favorite instrument to play uh, for me would be a Fender Stratocaster. It's just but then there's moments when it's time to pick up the D'Angelico New Yorker mm -hmm. or a nice Gibson. I mean, it's, it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of guitars behind me, some of which retailed for $79 at Sears back in the day. And some, my D'Angelico guitar is probably worth a hundred grand. So I don't know. I did the whole solo, the original solo on Hot Stuff by Donna Summer um, on a guitar I bought for 35 bucks. So, eh. It's whatever you happen to have at the moment. Mm -hmm. The best guitar that. is the one you have. Good answer. I love that. Okay. Camps Jam says, uh, do you remember any unreleased tracks, Countdown to Ecstasy, title track, Running Child, Gully Water? Um, like what does, but what does he remember? That, that's, I don't know. Did anything end up on the cutting floor that you wish had not, I guess, on those first three albums? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. I think we managed to get everything that was with a, that when we completed, it's like anything else. Sometimes things when you complete them aren't complete. <laughs> I just thought that makes any sense. So I think we managed to get everything that should have been on the record on the record. It's knowing when to be done, right? Like, cause that's a big, that's a big thing. I remember Gary Katz, ha, Gary had called me. He was producing someone, uh, a, a, a very talented young uh, female singer. And he had just basically finished the record. He said, I'm calling you into the studio. I need you to come down, bring all your gear. Uh, I want you to listen to this record. And I need you to add what it needs. I said, okay, Gary, you know, so I booked the session, brought all my stuff. I listened to the whole record all the way through. And I said, Gary, it's fine. It doesn't need anything else. He says, that's why I pay you triple scale. So good. 
That's such a good story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, sure. It's like it doesn't. It's good. I love it. Okay, so Joseph De Andrea. Sorry if I mispronounced your last name. We all know about the jazz legends, but were there any um, contemporary acts that influenced the early Dan? Hmm. Influences. Maybe uh, or influenced you. Well, uh, certainly you could say Horace Silver influenced Steely Dan because the intro to Do It Again is basically the intro to one of his songs. <laughs> um, and obviously the Duke Ellington track was something that we all uh, dove into and wanted to do because we were all big Duke Ellington fans. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much influence uh, um, that you could pick out. I think all of us ha were had such eclectic backgrounds the, in terms of the, of the band, uh, such varied and various pathways to get to Steely Dan. Mm. I think whatever influences there were, were um, amalgamations and synthesis of each of our styles. Mm, I love that. Like a perfect storm. Like y'all made this amazing soup with all, <laughs> all your special ingredients and dad's Dan nuclear physics, physics background and Dan soup, Dan soup. Yes. Steely Dan soup. Blue sky asks how many takes for the Ricky solo. Do you remember? Do you remember? Uh, very yeah. few mm. because I pretty much had what I wanted. I knew what I wanted. Planned it out so, before. Yeah. Good. I like it. Uh, Void. Okay. How was it playing in the Blues Brothers 2000 movie? <laughs> Did you wait? wait you were the, I forgot that. You're the Blues Brothers movie? <laughs> and the second one. Yeah. And the second one. Yeah. There were a number of us. B.B. King. Travis Tritt. And, how how was uh, that? Do you have a good time? We, we had an absolute ball. More fun than I could stand. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of, there were so many different artists on it. Stevie Winwood. And um, it's just so many players and so many guys. There were, the, the premise of the movie was that there were a battle of the bands and there was the Blues Brothers and then there was the Gator Boys. And we were the the Gator Boys, I guess. And getting together for four or five days to shoot this thing, bringing so many friends and so many people together, it was way, way too much fun. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Sounds like it. Okay, so I've got Syncat Pro says, oh, what is this Steely Dan song, Skunk Baxter? What, what were you most proud to play on? What's your, do you have a special... A special song to your heart or solo is there something that you're like yeah that's that's my that's my baby kind of thing well i kind of feel that way about everything that i've done uh i think mm -hmm. people ask me what is the uh, what what i think is the most iconic steely dan song and i always respond by saying it's razor boy because i listen to the elements of that song that's everything that I think Steely Dan was. Hmm. And I love playing on it. Okay. I like that answer. Look, that's a hard question. It's like asking to pick your favorite oh, child or mom, don't exactly. answer that. Exactly. Mom, mom, don't answer that. <laughs> and, and why is it me? No, just kidding. I love you, Ashley. Mm -hmm. my, sister, my sister's great. We love okay. Ashley and we love Connie. And if you're checking this out. They are. They're here. Look at how cool Simpsy is. Look at, she's Yay. awesome. She's on fire. We're having some fun. We're just having some chats. Okay, so, um, oh, taking it into current era, have you seen the Oppenheimer movie or what do you think about that? Interesting question. I'm looking forward to seeing it because uh, one of his colleagues was a gentleman named... Um, uh, well, let me let me let me just go back. Um, I've I've done a lot of work at Lawrence Livermore at the at the laboratory there, mm -hmm. 
and um, Dr. Edward Teller, who was the father of the hydrogen bomb, and I worked together on the laser advisory board there for some years. So I became very familiar with Dr. Teller and his relationship with, uh, with Oppenheimer, which was probably not optimal. So I would like to see the movie because I felt that Oppenheimer, in a lot of the ways that Alan Turing, I mean, Oppenheimer was not gay, but Alan Turing was gay and he was the father of modern computing and basically had his life ruined by idiots mm. in government and, mm. and, 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 you know, the, the public. Uh, Oppenheimer was a patriot. There's no doubt about it. What he did for this country is un, an indescribable. And there are a number of people who I've seen uh, do not either give him credit or are angry at him for the work that he did in inventing the hydrogen bomb. And I'll tell you a quick story. Okay. <laughs> um, and this may be politically incorrect, but I'm at an age now where I really don't care. Yeah, we don't care. Tell it. Uh, my father was uh, in World War II. And one of the last assignments he had postings was uh, working on the general staff at the Pentagon at the, uh, towards the end of World War II. And he um, was, had access to and was somehow involved with Operation Downfall, which was the code name for what was going to be the invasion of Japan. Uh, one million... Seven million uh, Japanese people ready to defend their country. Uh, 5,000 aircraft. Uh, Kamikaze had already made its debut. Uh, it was not looking very good for an invasion of Japan. And my dad, one evening, what he told me was one evening he looked at the plans for Operation Downfall. And he noticed that after the first day, there was no mention of the 1st Marine Division. And he said he had to go outside and, into the, and get some air because he realized what that meant. Now, mm. we can argue back and forth and we will constantly armchair and discuss and there will be opinions on either side. But I think it would be very difficult to argue against the fact that the atomic bomb played a extremely major role in ending World War II. Mm. You can argue how many lives were lost, how many lives were saved. And I tend to fall on the side of lives saved because when my dad described the casualty, expected casualty figures, they were horrendous. Hmm. Uh, it's probably still classified, so I'm not going to talk about it. Hmm. I mean, I, I have access to it, but I'm not going to talk about it. Okay. So I want to see the Oppenheimer movie because, um, like the movie about Alan Turing, uh, I would like to see if they give him the credit that I think he's due. So anyway, I didn't mean to be long-winded, but hmm. yeah, yeah, there's a lot of deep, and with Roger, because Roger had a background in nuclear physics, and so do I, simply because I've spent so much time working with these people uh, in different laboratories, uh, I'm really interested to see how it's treated. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Thank you for that answer, and thank you for the sure. long-windedness. There's a lot, there's a lot, yeah, that you can go into, and I appreciate you giving us a little bit of that. Um, intense. It's intense. Yes. So, all right, we're going to switch. We're going to switch speeds a little bit, ask a couple more questions and wrap it up. Um, so I have, oh, somebody wants to know if, have you seen the Yacht Rock comedy video series? Absolutely. I all love right. it. Okay, I good. Love it. Okay, good. Fabulous. Maybe my or, 
or Zik one. Thank you for that. Yep. Fabulous. Okay. Quick lightning round favorite non-steely skunk slow solo go skunk which solo i i i tried to say that fast and i just jumbled everything <laughs> favorite non-steely dan skunk baxter solo go oh my god i mean that's what 500 over... million solos yeah yeah okay, i Lex. think i think i think is there one that stands out let's not say favorite well, I like hot stuff. Today. That was fun to do. Hot stuff. You know, one more. It was a one more recording session, but I really enjoyed doing it. The, uh, the disco, right? You the, played on some Donna disco Summer. tracks. Yeah, you Donna played Summer. on Donna Summer. That's great. But I did it because Giorgio Moroder was the producer, said I could play anything I wanted. Yes. So, That's yeah, so that was fun. good. Skunk was on fun. the disco. Go listen to Hot Stuff by Donna Summer. I love, I actually love that. Yeah, that's great. And that that's was on great. that $35 Burns Bison Jr. guitar I bought for $35 bucks <laughs> yeah. at Guitar Center. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Okay, two more questions. Jeff knew Jimi Hendrix before he became famous. What was Jimmy's playing like before the experience? Oh, interesting. E exquisite. 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 Um, exquisite. I, I was a big fan of Little Beaver and a big fan of... Uh, of um, uh, Curtis Mayfield. And I was just delighted by the way he had synthesized their guitar playing. When you listen to Wind Cries Mary, for instance, oh my God. It, 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 and he was doing a version of it. Uh, I thought that was the most, one of the most exquisite things I'd ever heard. And the poetry and the lyrics in that song it's incredible. Mm. And he was a real sweetheart, a really nice man. I, that's, that's the wrong, I, I, a very special and wonderful human being to be around. Mm, you, Jimmy. You bet. Mm. God bless him. I wish he was here. Yeah. Yeah, that's a way too young thing for sure. I think uh, I'm sad my dad left us at 60 something but then you have like the 20 somethings and like i can't even believe how amazing they were at 27 like or whatever it's really it really is uh it really is something so i'm just glad well, your the dad chat. was like the musical moses moses brought the 10 commandments from the mount uh -huh. roger nichols brought the 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 quality of recording from the recording mount down to the believers. Ooh, I like that. Like he he was really good at being able to capture the genius that was happening. You bet. And and deliver it in the best possible way to oh, the yeah. listener. Oh, yeah. I I really I really do appreciate that now. Like I I understood that back then, but I I mean getting into sound therapy myself I mean, there is something about listening to a Steely Dan record on headphones where you could just hear all the instruments. And then, and then, I mean, that, that's a form of sound therapy, just being able to hear instruments the way they're supposed to sound where, where you could just like, you can kind of feel the notes. I think there's something to that. Oh, absolutely. When you hear a symphony orchestra, the way that the instruments are placed is specifically designed to allow you to hear every instrument and what it's doing and how it how it connects up to the overall piece of music. And I am taking it a step further in being able to feel the vibrations. I got this vibroacoustic table skunk and it's right. amazing. I got a I got a table where you lay on it and it's got transducers under it. Right. And you play these specific tracks, you play Sima frequencies, and it like almost vibrates you back into homeostasis. It's well, so remember um, that music is a what uh, Dr. Charlie Towns, who was my one of the guys that I work with at Lawrence Livermore, he uh, won the Nobel Prize for inventing the laser. Mm. Charlie was totally into music, and his he defined from a physics point of view, that a piece of music was a set of coherent oscillations, not just one, but a number of different oscillations, a number of different 
frequencies put together in such a way as that, that they created something special. Now, there are some cathedrals in Europe where when the choir sings the way the acoustics were designed, that super harmonic notes that are not sung by the choir appear in the, in the spectrum. In the same way, when you talk about the lower vibrations, those are the subharmonics from mm -hmm. some of the co coherent oscillations in a song. So yeah, you're, you're opening the spectrum to mm. people and, and focusing on some of that for healing purposes. I, and wait, didn't you say you and Walter actually at the Whiskey Go Go? Didn't y'all try to do something like that? Rig up something at the Whiskey Go Go? Yeah, Walter <laughs> was enamored with the with William Castle's subsonic tone of terror. So yes. we we got a bunch of different <laughs> bass cabinets, bass free reflex cabinets, and with a with a frequency generator, an os frequency oscillator generator, cranked it down. <laughs> past where human hearing was and uh it, it wasn't very successful a few things fell off the wall that was about it <laughs> yes the steely dan william castle whiskey go go concert experience there you go <laughs> i love it all right last question why and how did you get your nickname skunk uh that'll be in my book oh 